so here I am <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping hello anybody there okay so this is our second live video and I am still kind of trying to figure the whole thing out and I wanted to be outside, but we're having a big rainstorm. So um, what I thought I would do is I want to try to do this every week because first of all, I just had a good time. And also I get questions from you guys a lot and I'm not always able to answer them. So hi. So I'm going to do that. So last week here um, was the very first question that came through live. And I can't remember, and then I didn't write it down, who it was that asked it, but um, she came through when the video was actually, when I was trying to figure the whole thing out, and I actually was live. So she said, why were you put on restriction as a kid? Well, you know what? If I actually spent the time to sit here and tell you all the reasons why, it would bore you to death. But I did sort of um, go through it a little bit in Fearless in Chapter 2. I talked a little bit about my lying problem. And because of my father wound and because of the relationship that I had with my dad, um, and he was, he was a very authoritative, controlling parent. So I never felt, I never felt like I was, um, really loved by him, first of all. But secondly, I never felt comfortable. So that was, that led partly to a lot of acting out. So, I had a lot of problems at school. I, I had behavior problems. I would, <laughs> I'm not proud of this, but here we go. So I would steal things. I lied to the teachers. I changed my grades. Um, I didn't get in fights or anything at school because I was really too afraid to get in that kind of trouble. But I did a lot of things that um, teachers would, and even principals, I mean, it was just misbehavior. So everything I did, I got on, I got put on restriction. And then that just isolated me even more, to be perfectly honest. And that made it worse because then I got bored. So as I was bored, I did more acting out, for instance. So one time, um, my sister and I were grounded at the same time. And I was, I'd say I was probably about 10, I think. Most of my bad behavior was around 10 years old. So I was about 10 and I was on restriction, which at our house, that meant that you were confined to your room and mostly to your bed. And so I read a whole lot. Or the other option was that I could do um, educational workbooks, which I absolutely despised. <laughs> but, but we were allowed to do that. So I would sit on the bed and then I would read, but I got bored. And it was interesting because at the same time, for some reason, my sister was grounded too. We were on restriction together. And her room was directly beside mine. So I got this brainy idea, you know, I'm going to climb up in my closet and I snuck into the kitchen and I got a butcher knife out of the kitchen and I climbed up into the top of my closet and I gouged a hole through the drywall from my side of the closet up on the shelf. Now I climbed up on the shelf in the closet so nobody could see the hole. And I gouged a hole in the closet drywall through to the other side where my sister's room was so we could pass notes, which I don't know why I, I mean, you know, I was bored because we could have just passed the note from one side of the door to the other, but we weren't supposed to be talking to each other. So I guess I was trying to keep it secret. Anyway, that got me into big trouble because what happened was there was dust everywhere. And, you know, as a kid, I didn't know what the heck, I didn't know I was even making a mess. So... I got in big trouble over that, and my sister was really little at the time. I, if I was 10, she was probably 6, and so I was passing her notes, and I actually was, this I thought this was brilliant at the time, but I actually snuck into her bedroom, and I cut a, a flap out of the um, wallpaper to hide <laughs> the hole was under the wallpaper. So I don't know. Anyway, that's why I got on restriction all the time. I was always on restriction. I was always into trouble. I was always doing something I wasn't supposed to do. I was always acting out. So I was in trouble a lot. Um, Tiffany asks, what is your simplest, best marriage advice? Oh, wow. Um, well, I have heard this question posed to an older couple that have, they had been married for like over 50 years. And somebody asked them, what's your secret to staying married or remaining married or being happily married or whatever? 
And the answer was so beautiful. She said, or he said, one, I don't know, but one of them said, the secret to our being married, married happily for all this time is that neither of us fell out of love at the same time. And I thought that was so beautiful. And that's not really a marriage secret, but I think it's a plea that we as married people <laughs> can maybe pray <laughs> because, you know, you do go through ebbs and flows in a marriage where you're deeply in love and you're maybe you're passionately in love or you just are comfortable in love. And those are all good places to be. But there are times where you're just ready to bolt. And that's just the reality of it. And and maybe not even to leave, but just you're just blah, you know. So I think it's just grace that God doesn't maybe let us fall out of love at the same time. But also I would say for advice, I would say my best marriage advice would be you have to give 110% when you least feel like it. And that's just the truth of it. It's hard and it's sacrificial and that's why it grows us and it sanctifies us and prepares us for heaven. So it's not easy always. Sometimes it is, but um, sometimes it's really not. So I would say my best marriage advice is pray for the grace to just make it all the way. I mean, it's... I, I don't know that that's simple. I don't know. <laughs> Marriage is just hard, right? Okay, uh, Marie says, I know that I have a mother wound. Still not clear on my predominant fault. I can be very judgmental and can easily, excessively have my feelings hurt. Thoughts on how to clarify. How to clarify uh, a mother or a wound or a predominant fault, I think is probably the better question. Okay, so for me, the easiest way to clarify the predominant fault um, I, I, well, honestly, and this is just me, this is a Sonya-ism, it's not a saint quote or anything like that, but I would almost, um, I would almost say that every single fault ends up going back in some way to pride. We want our way all the time. And so, whether it's overeating, or maybe it's laziness, maybe it's OCD, maybe it's rebellion, as in my case, maybe it's rage or anger, which comes from rebellion, whatever your pr predominant fault is, ultimately they all go back to pride, because pride is wanting your own way, whether it's with another person or with God. So it can be narrowed down, I think, to that that simple a a fault because and this is what makes that so handy is always 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 when in doubt just humble yourself <laughs> the Bible says all all the time that if we will humble ourselves God will exalt us and so whatever the situation whatever the fault um, I don't know I would another probably good rule is to look at the the um, the deadly sins and those vices and maybe, you know, try to discern the one that you gravitate to the most. And that is usually your predominant fault. For me, I mean, mine is definitely pride. And, and I thought this was interesting because this, I mean, this could be me. Uh, very judgmental and easily or excessively have um, her feelings hurt. And so, obviously, I mean, that smacks of pride very loudly there. Judgmental. And, and it probably also... Uh, illustrates that you have a, um, I call it a gift of righteousness, and it really is. My husband has that that fault of criticism or, or judgmentalism, and so does my older son. But honestly, it's just their gift. It's a spiritual gift, the gift of righteousness. They know what is right, and they do it. They do the right thing. But it does make them judgmental because they see what is wrong. <laughs> so, And I think, I don't know, we can do that too, women, and, and I can be judgmental, not necessarily with other people. I give way more grace to other people than I do myself, and that's that comes from, that's pride too. It's a backward sort of pride. What I have to be better than other people, you know, everybody else can have this problem, or everybody else can, can be pardoned or forgiven or given lots of room, but I, you know, I have to hold myself to a different standard, and that's just pride. It really is. I mean, it's... I guess that's simple. Okay, so here's another one. How do I know if the Holy Spirit spoke to me if I didn't get the warm, fuzzy feeling? Well, that just takes practice. And ultimately, I the, part of the reason that I love Lectio Divina so much and the reason, um, and, and right now, what I've been doing is promoting Love the Word, which is Lectio Divina without the Latin. 
So it's the Love the Word um, initiative includes the method, Mary's method, L-O-V-E, listen, observe, verbalize, and entrust. And I've been talking about that a lot on my Facebook page. And I'm going to do more of that because I think it's so, so important that we get into the scriptures on a daily basis. And so um, when we talk about how to hear the Holy Spirit, that is the number one way. But once we're in there and we're in the Bible on a daily basis, and that will lead to another question, but once we're in there on a daily basis, how do we know it's Him? Well, one of my favorite ways is I I love the fact that in the Bible it's black and white. So maybe I'm drawn to a particular verse because I'm just drawn to it. Maybe it's my personality. Maybe it's my circumstances, whatever. But ultimately, I always trust that that's the Holy Spirit, and I try to see if, if I get the same Um, the same direction for several days in a row. So for me, twice makes a pattern. And so if I am not clear, if I'm hearing from the Holy Spirit, then I ask him, could you um, give me some more? Could you help me with this and make, make sure that I am doing the right thing? But ultimately, it just takes practice. So you have to be in the scriptures on a daily basis because he speaks in several ways. He speaks through the church. He speaks through the scriptures. He speaks through prayer. Um, and he speaks through other people. So if all of those things are saying the same thing, then you can just about bet that that is the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, it just takes practice. We have to keep um, practicing with it. Okay, um, I'm, these are actually two questions, and I'm kind of going to combine them in one. And then this will be the last um, for today. And then the rest of these I'll get to next week. We're going to do this every Wednesday. So I'm going to do a Facebook Live every Wednesday at a different time. So sometimes I'll do them in the morning, sometimes afternoon, sometimes like this late afternoon, and then sometimes in the evening. So Rhonda and Tony say, for those who seem to start things and do not finish or stop after a few weeks, what is your suggestion for incorporating liturgy of the hours and or journaling, especially when life with kids gets so busy? And Tony says, how do I develop discipline? I seem to always start out strong and after a few weeks, what I have started just fades and pretty soon I'm no longer doing it. But I always seem to have to desi- a desire to do it, just not the discipline to set, stay consistent. Well, you know what? Welcome to the human family. I love this particular verse from St. Paul. He says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will or to want to dwells within me. Uh, to, to will is present within me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. <laughs> so if it's true of Paul, it's true of us. He says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. That's in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. So truly, this is difficult for everybody. And the hard but true answer is you just must develop the discipline. And it ultimately, psychiatrists and psychologists tell us that it takes 30 days to develop a new habit. So if you can stick with it for 30 days, it becomes easier. And if you do small things for 30 days, build small habits, that will help you with the self-discipline to build um, up to bigger habits. So don't try to do too much at one time. For instance, if you want to do the Liturgy of the Hours, just start with the Gospel and make it five minutes, but make it every single day and be disciplined about it. And you're going to have to You're going to have to be disciplined about carving out the time. You're going to have to maybe um, keep your family from intruding on that time. That's what I had to do. Everybody knew that this particular time in the early, early morning was off limits. That meant I had to get up very early. It meant I had to later on when the kids were um, a little when they were born and then a little bit bigger and were a little more noisy and intrusive, I had to put some rules down. I had to, you know, you have to change the process some, but start out very, very small, five minutes, and then build up to the whole liturgy of the hours. I mean, that's, that's a good hour to spend in the scriptures and in prayer. So just start small. And that's true of every habit in your whole life. You know, just instead of trying to do big things. You know, Mother Teresa said, don't try to do the big things. Do the small things and do them with great love. So start out small and then build to something bigger. I have so many other questions to get to and I'm going to do it again next week. So thank you all for coming. And um, if you have questions, I will post again that um, that meme, the um, Ask Me Anything string and then you can leave your questions there in that thread and I'll get to them next week. So thanks for coming and I'll see you later.